So, hello, happy Earth Day, and welcome to the Stroud Center's kickoff of our 2021 science lecture series with the theme of the intersection of art and science. Stroudwater Research Center seeks to advance knowledge and stewardship of freshwater systems through global research, education, and watershed restoration. And arts played an important role here at the Stroud Center since our founding in 1967. So this year's lecture theme echoes the culture here at the Stroud Center. And I want to thank Princeton Hydro for sponsoring today's lecture and thank all of you who are joining us for the lecture today. We are thrilled that you're here and we're so excited to host a presentation by the eco-revelatory artist, Stacy Levy, who joins us from the Ridge and Valley of Pennsylvania. Stacy grew up in Philadelphia and grew up drinking water from the Schuylkill River as a quick fact. Stacy works with rain, tides, and watersheds to visualize these capillaries of the landscape as they carry rainwater from sky to sea. Her works appear in Philadelphia, New York, Seattle, Phoenix, Tampa, Miami, San Antonio, and Fayetteville, Arkansas. She often collaborates with engineers, ecologists, landscape architects to make artworks that help solve stormwater runoff, water pollution, and stream bank erosion. Stacy graduated with a BA from Yale University, majoring in art and forestry, and got her Master of Fine Arts from Tyler School of Art at Temple. She has been honored with the Henry Meigs Environmental Leadership Award, Penn Future Award for Women in Conservation, and a, and a Pew Fellowship in the Arts. During Stacy's presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to post questions that we'll get to at the end. Stacy, we are thrilled to learn more about your work, so take it away. Great, thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Jessica, for all the setup and thank you to Princeton Hydro for supporting this. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be um, giving this talk to Stroud, a place that I've always held dear um, and uh, a place that is open to the idea of inter the intersection of science, ecology and art, uh, which is just about the cusp that I work on. Um, and I'm gonna introduce you to my projects and my thinking behind that. And we'll get started, let's see if we can, okay, should be going. So one thing that's important to think about, which we often forget because we're so immersed in it, is that we're living in a sort of mythology of technology. And it's been very helpful for solving many problems, but it's also fracturing our relationship to nature. Um, we've sort of learned, lost track of how to share with nature. Sharing is something we learned very early on, sort of a kindergarten lesson. And yet we are not very good at sharing our spaces with nature. And we often think of nature as something to take from, to extract, not to live with. But um, one of the most important things that I think we're starting to see that we need to take from nature is to, to have a relationship with it. We're losing that and we're seeing the problems of losing that relationship. And we need to feel connected because nature is very much part of us. So how do we find or refine this connection to nature? And how do we stop segregating ourselves from it? Doug Talame, a great writer you're probably um, mostly familiar with, is, is very strong with this idea that we can no longer think of ourselves as outside of nature. And the, the segregation of ourselves and nature is one of our bigger problems with, um, with what's going on with the world. Um, we know that the patterns in nature repeat themselves at all scales. This dendritic pattern in particular is repeated from tree limbs to watersheds. Um, and we sort of need to get a sense that we are not ourselves separate from that pattern. They're inside of us. It's the exact same pattern. This dendritic pattern is the same pattern that carries our blood inside our bodies. The same pattern that carries river water throughout the land. But this is how we make a home in, in our engineered world for water moving through the land without much respect for that beautiful dendritic pattern. 
It's very disconnected. It's uncelebrated. It's not a place for a relationship with nature when you are piping water um, somewhere. So I feel very strongly that art may be the tool that we use to find solutions, to build better with nature, to share the environment, to share our built spaces with nature. As an artist, um, I am working with engineers and doing a lot of engineering myself, as well as working with ecologists, but I'm doing it in a slightly different way coming from an artist standpoint. And I'm trying to expand the creative scope. And I'm also thinking about nature as my client and that I'm working for nature. But I do think that engineers and ecologists, planners, conservationists, all need to join with this, this artistic viewpoint to, to build better in our environment. Because when we come into contact with nature, um, we make these very degraded places where the relationship to nature is not a good one. Our, our typical engineering solutions are um, tired, they're old, and they're not in consort with the natural processes that, are, that they're trying to serve. So I think it's very important to address the needs of ecology. And some of the, just a simplified way of sort of checking whether you're doing this is figuring out if your projects are supporting what nature wants, which is to be soggy and scruffy, not to be dry and smooth, which is how we like our cities, our roadways, our, our basements. So we really need to look at how we can live better with nature. Um, so with the soggy, to try and promote the soggy, allowing rainwater, both the time and the space to infiltrate. And with the scruffy, to introduce more of that is sharing our built surfaces with plants and water, making sure we are not taking over the entire surface of the earth. So here's some soggy. One thing to remember is that water in the landscape inhales and exhales like breath. It spreads out when it's raining and then it contracts when it's dry. But we need to give water the space to exhale and inhale and give it the time it needs to soak in also instead of driving it out of our environments to somewhere else. With the scruffy, we need to share the landscape with more vegetation, particularly more diverse vegetation. And even these small tangles of shrubs um, support far more species than the landscape that we so love, the lawn. I really think it's time to, build, to make sure our built world is more connected to nature. And we often think about how we want the world to be. Now it's time to practice how we want the world to be and make it happen. So what can art do to forge a better relationship with nature? Um, one thing is, is art can take a role with collaborative partnering across disciplines. I do a lot of work with engineers, with land and building architects and with ecologists to team up together to find a way to make solutions to simple site issues such as rainwater runoff or water pollution. So I'm very interested in how we as a, as a cross-disciplinary team can create celebratory ways to connect and to enhance or support natural processes happening on the site. Um, we're here, this picture is of the um, Schuylkill Center um, for Environmental Education in Philadelphia. Some of you may be familiar with this site. And um, the, the sort of concept here is that buildings need to drink their own rainwater. So over time, we need to design all buildings to drink their own rainwater and not to pass it on down to the stream below. Um, so uh, I'm very interested in how artists and landscape architects, building architects, engineers can create spaces that share the landscape with rain and with people so that there's a place for both the rain and for the people. And one thing that I've come up with is this idea of the bunk bed effect. So that rain gets to go down through a porous bunk bed, the plants get to grow up um, and add biodiversity. And meanwhile, your feet stay dry. And these bunk bed, the bunk bed approach creates more equitably shared spaces. Here's a space which people can, can be in, but also plants can happily be in undisturbed by compaction. Um, so the solution is taking sort of two angles to utilize the processes 
at work already with nature. Water, rainwater is coming, looking for a place to infiltrate, to soak in. And then to figure out how to share the space with people and with the natural processes themselves in a celebratory, beautiful, intriguing, educational way. And I do a lot of work with creating more infiltration, um, engineering spaces so that rain can have more time and more space to infiltrate into the soil. And this work is very collaborative, a long list of, of, of people who've worked on this. Meliora Design was the engineers for this project. Uh, it's not something that a single discipline takes on themselves. So the collaborative effect of uh, the collaborative nature of this is very important. And there's also, it requires, for me, it requires lots of community support um, because this soggy landscape business is not hugely supported yet, but in time it may be. So um, the rewards are great though. You get plant diversity, you get beauty, which is a very important thing. Um, and you get a working system that's collaborating with natural processes. So a system that kind of works because nature isn't working against it. And these small places can become very important spaces for people like outdoor classrooms, outdoor spaces to be, which during the pandemic became extremely prime as a place where you could gather if it was outdoors. So these places have a premium now that they almost didn't have before, but also they're places to celebrate rain in the landscape. That's a very important thing that we forget. We certainly used to celebrate rain. I, I used to just marvel at rain coming out of gutters and I floated sticks down waterways that were uh, filled with floodwaters from rain. But we sort of lose that sense of wonder and that sense of, of pleasure that we get from nature and bringing it back into a site is also one of my jobs. But one thing is to remember that porosity is very important. That is a way to welcome the rain because the rain wants to soak in. It does not wanna be sent downstream, but we have a tendency to um, take it and, and stick it into the nearest downslope stream. Um, so creating these natural, giving a place for natural processes, celebrating them and making a space where these processes can flourish which and also have space that where it's fun, enjoyable, and educational for people to stack those up in the bunk bed is is one of the things I'm always trying to do with my work. In terms of that's inviting the soggy. In terms of inviting the scruffy, though, you see this is a slightly you know this is a wet landscape. How do we share our hardscapes with natural processes? We have so many square miles of asphalt and concrete as parking lots. What can we do about these spaces? Or in this case, this is um, near Pier 53 of the Delaware, leftover um, industrial spaces that are foundations or parking, old concrete areas, completely covered with hardscape. So what can you do to undo this hardscape world that we've created? And one of the things is looking at what destroys hardscape, which is freeze and thaw process and mimicking that process, harnessing it so that you can have it happen on the site. So I, in this project, I'm borrowing um, the process of freeze thaw and making it both active and highly visible through art. So I'm drawing the watershed on these, these industrial leftovers, these hardened shoulders of the river, a river that requires all waterways should have soft, vibrantly biodiverse shoulders of vegetation. And in the industrial cities, most of them have concrete right up to the water's edge. So what do you do with this? I drew this and then we cut away the asphalt, creating basically a garden in the parking lot, filled it with soil and planted it with native species. So now these, these hard shoulders are being softened up a little increment at a time. We couldn't afford to take all of the concrete and asphalt out of this site because it would have been too expensive to haul it and to dump it. And it also felt like we were passing the buck. So we were trying to create a garden within the hardscape. This is three growing seasons later and it's really bringing scruffy to the city. Um, other site issues are going on too. Those hardscapes don't filter all the pollutants that are coming off of cars and, and, and sort of that are flowing through our parking areas. 
So they just go down to the stream or go down to the river. Is there a way to stop that? We know that um, buffer zones are very important on the side of waterways. Maybe we need to create more urban buffer zones within our parking lots so that, that all the runoff and um, pollution can be, can be captured in the roots of the plants. This idea of making a new kind of waterway, urban waterways, rain gardens and parking lots, uh, thinking of swales as the new urban streams may be a way to rethink the hardscape of our urban areas and suburban areas too. In this case, we're repurposing the concrete. You can see the parking line striping there um, on the stones. That's the first season and that's the second season. The pads of concrete that we left, though they seemed like, oh, we're leaving all this concrete, actually turned out to be excellent for preventing compaction because people jump from pad to pad. Um, and left them. So the roots got less compaction, was much more interesting than smooth lawns and continuous concrete. So the lesson is sharing built space with nature. Um, and thinking that even the smallest change, even the smallest piece of the living world is better than none at all. And we do need nature to be with us. I remember I took this picture of this girl. She's playing in a tiny little puddle because it was a piece of nature that she was making a connection to. So these are part of the many small changes that are being made slowly that art is helping make. This is a project at the Springside School in Philadelphia. And I was, I think they, when they first gave me the project, they thought I was gonna do rain barrels, but I looked at this worthless piece of lawn and thought we have to change that. Lawn is, is basically a kind of uh, suburban rug and it's not very effective in a natural way. So how can we create things that we need on the site, things like conveyance and infiltration. How do we keep the, the rainwater from flowing directly into the creeks? And how do we engineer in our urban settings this time and space that water needs to soak in? Um, so here, art and engineering are collaborating to give rain a home on the, spite, on the site, a place for it to soak in. The rain falls out of the sky, it's conveyed down the walls, which are just a way of showing that it's connected to the watershed. And then the important action is where it infiltrates into the soil. And instead of it going rolling down through a pipe and going right into the stream and scouring the banks, um, which is a huge issue with our sur suburban and urban streams, um, we're creating beautiful garden-esque places for the water to infiltrate. And um, in that infiltration, that process, there's a great deal of surface beauty, such as we have a river of irises and banks of blossoming asters here. So redeeming the scruffy, a lot of people are afraid of scruffiness. They like the trim of trim lines of a lawn, but there's so much more biodiversity with, with a scruffier landscape and so much more place for both rain and plants and all the insects and birds that rely on those plants too. So even though there's less space for people in these projects, it's always a more intriguing space, a more condensed space that people can really enjoy the surrounding nature. It's very important to share the real estate with the rain and um, to then for people to enjoy the new spaces that are created for both rain and people, not solo for people. One thing too to remember is art has a, a kind of hidden secret, uh, secret superpower. It can be a very powerful way of showing change over time. Um, and it's, it's can function and the new art that, that I've been trying to participate in is functioning more like a noun less like a noun and more like a verb. It doesn't just sit there, it's changing and it's showing change. And that's a really important part of, of what art can do. It can give people a sense of before and after, night and day, wet and dry, cold and warm. Here's a wet, dry situation. This is the Frick Environmental Center in Pittsburgh, which is creating a place for the rain. The living building challenge and all the rain from the roof is celebrated and then uh, instead of stuck into the pipes and sent down into the lowest stream in the area, it's, it's sent to wetlands where it's then filtered and reused. And this is a place where people in nature can meet and it needs to work in different weathers. It needs to work when it's dry, 
and it needs to work and hold all the rain when it's wet. And it needs to work in the in-between, which is probably its most constant state. Um, one of the things when I was creating this piece that I wanted people to see the pattern of the geology that is in the forest and the stream below this project and it kind of create a mnemonic in their head so that when they went down to into the natural stream, that kind of pattern would allow them to see the very delicate geomorphology of the, the uh, watershed there, it sort of prime them to see that. So art can give a new direction for how to live with rain in the modern world, not to send it to the next stream, but to actually participate in its processes. And um, I have to work with engineers, happily work with engineers to figure out the calculations for how much space the water needs, how much time the water is going to be there to make sure the system functions extremely well and we don't have water in the basement. But we do end up making these spaces that are great for people and for the natural process that it's supporting. I think a lot of this comes with this need we have to change how we see nature more as a sustainer, not just as a natural resource and as a place for other, other life forms, not just as an ecological service. Nature as a home, not as property, and nature as something truly essential to our humanness and not as capital. Here's a, another water pollution issue that I was solving through a, a collaborative engineered artwork. So what, always looking at how can art be part of a solution instead of just sitting there and looking pretty. So here's a project in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm making a floating wetland. And it's based on an artwork that is very near to my heart, though also leaves me a little cold because it just is this great gesture that has, it's an environmental art, but it is not an ecological art. It doesn't do anything. So I took this pattern and I also was looking at uh, the biomimicry of floating wetlands, a way of creating more wetland real estate, um, oftentimes in very uninspired non-visual forms, sort of like floating mattresses. But it's a wonderful system where the roots underneath the floating wetland are taking up um, the, the uh, pollutants, which are nutrients in this case, um, excess nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus, the cyanobacteria and other microorganisms are absorbing these from the lake water. So I'm creating a living, breathing artwork in the shape of the spiral jetty, but with the workability of floating wetlands. Um, with Juncus suffusus and this one growing, growing up as, as leaves and down as roots, uh, which also makes incredible habitat for birds and fish and turtles very protected from feral cats, which is really important for the bird populations, and the fish are in the tangled shade beneath. So it's functional and beautiful, and a, a home for many species, and a delight for humans, a place to, to go to, to sort of a destination as you're kayaking on this urban lake. So the idea that art can help solve water pollution in a way that is beautiful and evocative and educational and in complete collaboration with engineering and ecology. It's um, a problem that we have separated these disciplines, the disciplines of art and engineering, architecture and ecology. They've been, they've been segregated from each other. And this separation has denied us a way of coming up with new answers to our old problems and new ways to live better with natural processes. So I really think it's very important to do more collaborative work, to work across disciplines so that we can make new solutions and better decisions because we're facing a lot of issues that are only getting worse with climate crisis. And in order to create the resiliency we need, we need to work across disciplines. So I think it's something that's very important that while we're creating solutions, we also have to take steps towards making those connections to nature that humans truly need. And um, art is a very important tool for making nature legible to all of us. So one lesson, embrace the new soggy. And 
introduce and include the, the new scruffy into all our built scapes. And some people say, well, have you, have you tested these things out? Do you, are you certain they work? I think it's very important to just start the experiment. For the most part, everything works extremely well, but you sort of have to stretch out and, and try it because um, we're, we're possessed. It's a wonderful quote, Asia Monet reads, writes, we're, we create because we're possessed by our questions, not because we have the answers. We may not have the exact answers, but getting closer is far more important than sitting back and waiting for someone else to come up with the answer. So I just hope that anyone who is in a profession that could collaborate across disciplines, think about how we can collaborate and create new relationships with nature in everyday spaces like this Walmart parking lot where um, the scruffy is going to take over the, the uh, hardscape. So from parking lots to schools, inviting nature into every setting that we create um, and to make sure that we really look into the connection between things, not separating things out as we are so good at, but looking more at the relationship between and amongst the parts so that we can regain our connection to nature. And so thank you very much for Zooming with me. And I'd love to hear any questions you have about this work and um, any projects you're thinking about and thinking about how you're thinking about collaboration. Thank you. Stacy. that was wonderful. <laughs> I'm <laughs> amazed by your creativity and imagination and how you make it real uh, and you put you put it on the ground for us all to see and explore and experience. I think it's, it's fantastic. We've got some great questions. So let me uh, read you uh, some questions here. Uh, and we'll start with Marie's question. I found that solutions that integrate art and or better for the environment often take up more space than typical approaches. How have you dealt with pushback to the, these approaches that might take away from typical urban infrastructure? Yeah, that it's, it, is, it is difficult. Pe people have a lot of pushback and in very practical ways to say, we need parking for 103 cars. And I say, can you get by with um, 97 spaces? And can I have the other ones? No, no, 103. So, so I'm, often wheeling and dealing with the idea that finding out, when do you really need 103 parking spaces? Oh, we need that for Black Friday after Thanksgiving. Well, can we do a temporary parking situation somewhere else? Or can we even cover over our scruffy temporarily with, with something like Muon or plywood and, and then have people park on it which they probably, they're not gonna be 103 cars, but that's not what the people think. And then remove those a day or two later. Um, so I'm often having to make uh, solutions with vegetation that can be taken down um, if people are worried about it or, or modified so that people can park over it or, or walk over it. Usually um, the fears and the requirements are uh, in the beginning and everyone's worried about it, but once the project is in, people learn to move around the vegetation and they start to love the vegetation. And so they're very happy with it. So a lot of it is just getting people to feel that they're, that they have some flexibility until they get to know the piece. And once they get to know it, they tend to get to love it. Yeah, it's the case where sometimes we don't know what we want and what mm -hmm. we until we see it and experience it. And then it has value and it has intrinsic value. <laughs> then we, we want it there. We accept it as part of our environment. That's exactly it. And that happens so often. So you has a, as the creator, you have to hope for that future adoption of the beauty and not worry about the sort of friction that you're getting. Because people think that they just have a number in their mind. I need to park my car. And when they see the beauty, they're thinking, Eh, maybe I'll park my car over here. It won't matter so much. I can, I'll stick it over there or I'll ride my bike. 
Let me share with you another question from Nancy, and this, this speaks to your experience across a very broad geography of the, the entire country. Do you think that this idea of buildings drinking their own water might might be different in the southwestern U.S. where rainwater is becoming an incredibly controversial commodity? Oh, that's an interesting question because a lot of people say, well, what about drought? Well, you need the water even more. In the east, you drink your own rainwater as a building to preserve the creeks below. But in the west and in droughty areas, you need to store your own rainwater or let it go back into the soil because it's such a rare and precious commodity. So you do wanna, you don't wanna just pour it out into a culvert or into the, the storm drains. You wanna keep it, either keep it around for watering other components of the landscape or just allow it to soak into the soil because soaking in infiltration is a hugely important part of any kind of dry environment. And when you stop that soaking in, that's where you get a lot of problems. The aquifers aren't being, um, don't get a, a new set of water to, to infiltrate into them. The deeply rooted um, dry plants don't get to have their roots touch water. So infiltration is actually in some ways more important in dry areas. Now, if people take their rainwater and bottle it and, and make money from it, I, I mean, that's not exactly, uh, uh, what I had in mind because I'm all about sharing the, the nature with more nature, but it's still better to do something with it than to just cast it into a pipe and send it downstream. Well, we, that's exactly the message that scientifically is, is so important, infiltration. Uh, we need infiltration and infiltrating as opposed to putting things in pipes is a solution for so many of the problems that we have for sure. There's an interesting question here and I, uh, I will paraphrase uh, by asking Chuck's question. Um, he's, he's reflecting on how you incorporate engineering into your artwork, um, but he's wondering on the role of sociologists and psychologists and what uh, collaboration there is there and what role they play. Oh, I thought that was a really cool question. And it's like, oh yeah, I kind of forgot about those people. Um, I actually have a friend who's visiting who's a psychologist and I should sort of pick her brain about how that can be. Um, I think it's really interesting. Richard Louvre, who wrote um, Last Child in the, in the Woods, is that the, the title, has been talking a lot for years about the psychology of missing nature, of nature deficit disorder and how parts of our brain have trouble developing unless they have a connection to nature. I think that there's a great deal to be said for looking into collaborations with psychologists to, um, and sociologists to prove how important this, this is to bring nature back so that people will value the bringing it back and, and spend a little extra to create and maintain um, parking lots that share more with nature. Um, what what would change if I was if I sat down with ecologists or with sociologists while I'm designing would be very interesting. And I think on my next project I should make sure that that happens too because it'd be interesting to think about how the design could change to make it even more embracing of the human spirit in such a way that would would make people um, think a lot about preserving nature instead of stepping on it. Yeah, that's a, another dimension entirely to, well, the work both from an artistic perspective, uh, but also from a scientific perspective. Um, science and sociology and how we solve problems are very tightly linked. Here's a question from Marie. Have you ever worked on any Superfund sites? Um, not, no, not, I have not. I've come close to some brownfield sites. I'm actually doing an art master plan in Hazelwood, which, is, which has parts of it, it's in Pittsburgh, parts of it are perhaps a super fun, but never, never a, like a, a really deeply chemicalized site, except once, on the, I mean, basically every industrial site that I've worked on has far more um, pollutants in it than anyone wants to attest to. I have worked on um, 
coal mining um, sites and um, have worked with acid mine drainage. Um, they're not super fun sites, but they've been carefully looked at and people have tried to figure out what to do with these sites and have often just covered them over. And I worked with a team in um, near Johnstown um, in Bentondale um, to uh, create a, a treatment system that also was wonderful and educational to walk through. It's called Acid Mine Drainage and Art and it's in Bentondale, Pennsylvania. Um, and we worked very closely with, with, um, with a lot of people, including the coal companies because it was a, a mitigation project. Here's a, here's a question I think that, that we're all kind of wondering from Mary and I'll, I'll paraphrase by asking, how much time does it take to do some of these projects? Uh, when you look at thinking about this, it's, it's mind blowing your work. So could you give us a sense of how much time goes in, into some of these? You know, it's interesting. The time that it takes is sort of the runway to get to do it. I have to do a lot of permitting for these projects, particularly when they're in water. Um, even though they're temporary sometimes or they're sort of pilot projects. Um, there's a lot of buy-in I need from the community. So there are a lot of community meetings that I'm going to, we need funding. So there's a lot of the time that it takes to collect the funding is long, but the actual building of them, um, I'm collecting materials and designing for maybe an actual three months and then installations are anywhere from one week to a month. So they can go in pretty fast, but it's all that upfront activity, the administrative activity. So in the end, about 75% of a project is spent on the computer or in meetings, not out on the site. Yeah, and I imagine that that's what, that's what leads to the success is having the buy-in and having the communication with partners on the ground who want you to succeed. Yeah, I think so. Though sometimes I think I should just go out there and build these and then people can agree or disagree while they're helping me put them up. We've got a question from Anne. She says, who created the amazing graphic early in your slide showing a forest of trees looking like currency? Oh, that is, uh, I, I believe that artist is, is Maria Gonzalez, and it was picked up from a, a site somewhere I saw it was an illustration for an article. Um, but I think it's really, I think that's a really great, it's a very subtle graphic that talks about the commodification of our natural world. Okay, here, here's another, here's another specific question from Maria. She says, how can I find that blue bunk bed stuff you use? Maria, you are a real materialist here. <laughs> I think there's an artist in our midst. Um, that bunk bed stuff I use is, is expanded um, expanded metal. And it's, uh, a, it's a very cheap industrial metal. It's what's used for catwalks. It's very good for, it's, got, it's very grippy. It's not something you want to do with bare feet and it needs paint, but it's, um, it's a wonderful material and it's just expanded metal. It's one of the cheapest, porous uh, steel materials that's out there. Here's a question from Kat. Are there any native plants that are especially spongy that could help soak up lots of water around my property? There are, but you, you, if you have a lot of, it depends more about what your soil condition is like with the water. And um, you should work with a engineer or a landscape architect to make sure you're doing the right thing. But basically, if you have, if it's your backyard and you're not sure what to do with it, I would throw a bunch of the various shrub dogwoods in there and see what happens. You can also be putting in various asters and, and cardinal flowers, but, but the shrub dogwoods are really great for just dealing with a soggy situation. And they're beautiful with their redder stems. And so I, I use them a lot at, at my farm to mark, to demarcate the passage of water in a wet meadow and it makes a beautiful red stemmed map. So that would be my plant of choice. And I'd also note if you navigate to www.stroudcenter.org. Oh, there you go. <laughs> to the restoration page of our website, we have some downloadable resources that give you a complete list of 
native trees, native shrubs that are recommended for planting in this region, so. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting too is put more of them in than you think and let it, just let it go because those wet areas that are wet sometimes and dry sometimes or very, very wet are the most interesting landscapes that are best served by having a great deal of vegetative diversity on it versus something dumb and banal like lawn. Ken's got a great question. Have you considered adding sound? Water has so many possibilities. Um, I usually let the soundtrack be nature and what's happening. I'm trying to attract a lot more insects and a lot more birds to these sites. So that tends to be the, the, um, the sound. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of drumming possibility with the water going down these pipes and hitting surfaces. But I haven't really explored that yet, but um, I'm totally open to it. There's some wonderful water clocks. I know there's one particular in London that basically is, uses the percussive power of rain. But I'm right now more interested in what happens with rain and where it gets to reside. Um, so I haven't been concentrating on its sound that much. But I, we, did, <laughs> we did put a metal roof on our on an addition that we put on about a decade ago so that we could hear the percussive quality of rain and it sort of tuned differently than another roof on the other part of our house. So we do think about those things. Cool. Mary has a question. Do you make or design your floating wetlands from scratch or do you connect prefabricated floating wetlands? I, I fabricate prefabricated floating wetlands. I'm using a system called bee mat, like buzzing bee. Um, and they're down in Florida. In Florida, they use, a, because it's warmer there, they use a lot of floating wetlands in golf courses and um, in condos, uh, retention basins, and also uh, some for sewage treatment. And in New Zealand and, um, and in Thailand, they use a lot of floating wetlands for sewage treatment. So there are a number of systems. There are a good 20 different systems that you can buy. You can make your own too, um, but it's not, um, they're not quite as sort of crispy and beautiful. And I didn't wanna, you can make them with recycled um, water bottles as floats and various matrixes on the top. But I needed to have a system that looked really good and that I could leave behind and not have to maintain every week. So I use this existing system. Right. Well, we're approaching the end of our time for today. So Stacy, I want to thank you for sharing your incredibly inspiring work with us. Your creativity and imagination are truly a path for all thank of you. us, both enriching our lives and simultaneously solving environmental challenges. So I'm so thankful for your art and your work and what you've shared with us today. I also want to thank you. Everyone who's joined us today, remember that you can connect with the Stroud Center on our website and through social media. I'd also note that we welcome your support as it helps us accomplish our mission here at the Stroud Center. And we thank Princeton Hydro for their continued support of our work and this uh, seminar today. And finally, there's so much more to come in this year's Intersection of Art and Science lecture series. And next up on June 23rd is Dr. Jennifer Adler. She's a renowned conserv conservation photographer and underwater photojournalist who's worked on assignment for National Geographic, the Nature Conservancy, and many other organizations. So please uh, put June 23rd on your calendar. Join us for that. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we hope to see you in June. Celebrate Earth Day and thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.